I'm absolutely delighted to introduce you to Steph uh, Jackson. She is a, a marine conservationist. I'm just going to read out. So Steph has been studying and she's been doing applied marine zoology and conservation uh, at Cornwall College. And her ultimate goal is to work as an expedition researcher and share her passion for the natural world with other people. She loves, she wants to make people fall in love with the natural world and inspire its protection. And um, she's really big, heavily inspired by a guy called Steve Backshaw. So I don't know whether all of you know who he is, but he's certainly pretty well known in the UK. She's met him a couple of times. And uh, so she'd love to be working with him. And of course, she's inspired by Sir David Attenborough. I won't harp on too much about myself. I uh, just wanted to give, give a bit of a background because um, I kind of also wanted to prove that it doesn't matter if you're a bit nervous of things or if you're, you know, a bit later on starting things that it's never too late or you're never too, you know, un underqualified or any of that rubbish. Um, so before I started studying, I was working in a children's soft play. I'd always loved animals. I'd done college with animals and all that, but I had no idea what I was going to do. I went on my first backpacking trip. I'll try and keep this quick and short, but I just, I, like, I kind of like my own story. It's a bit big headed, but there we go. Um, I went on my first backpacking trip around Sweden and finished in Northern Norway in Andernes. And it makes me a bit emotional because that is the place that changed my life. Um, I went on a boat on a whale watching trip and I saw my first ever cetacean, my first ever whale. He was a sperm whale called Glenn. Yeah. It blew me away. Um, the next day, I had only booked one trip, but I booked another one. I couldn't get enough. I got really seasick that second trip, and the woman who um, was the manager of the company uh, recognised me from the day before, picked me up and said, look, whale, because she knew I wanted to see that whale, but I just wasn't feeling great. So she dragged me to the side, and that I never forgot, because it was just like, you know, I don't know. It was very special. Um, after that, I came home and I met Steve Backshaw, who was doing a talk um, about sharks. Um, it was with an organisation called Bite Back, and it was an anti-finning kind of organisation. And he was talking about his work with sharks and things like that. And I rang my mum and I said, I want to do marine conservation. And my mum said, and this is the thing, the thing that I always got in my way, but you're scared of fish. Because I, for years, I had a massive phobia of fish, boats, couldn't look at a boat, freaked me out too much. And my mum's like, why? <laughs> of all studies, you can do uh, you can do zoology, you can do zoological conservation, why marine? And I just, I don't know. Those two things, and I, this is my thing. I was terrified. I have anxiety problems. I deal with it all the time, but I've travelled. I've traveled the world. I've been to Madagascar. I've been to Sweden and Norway on my own. Um, nothing is going to get in your way. Um, three years later, I was in work experience for that company, which is why it made it to me emotional. That's the picture in the top. Um, and the picture on the beach was my, they held a leaving barbecue for me. Um, we had a bonfire on the beach. That's actually 12 o'clock at night. It was during the midnight sun. Um, and it was incredible. So it just shows you those tiny little moments that you don't think will really become anything, but a memory can actually become a lot more. Um, so since then, I've got my first BSAC. I do this because I can, to me, like the pictures are like, I'm portrait, and then I realize it's not behind me, but the middle picture, the scuba diving picture, is um, when I became uh, qualified, I got my first qualification in BSEC scuba diving, that's British Tobacco Club, and the lovely picture of me on the beach with my pup is when I handed in my dissertation this year. Obviously, because of lockdown, I couldn't get the traditional handing in on campus, so where better to go than the beach with my dog, really. Could we, could we ask for anything better, really? Um, that's my local beach. So that's just kind of a bit of a background about me. Um, and I kind of hope that it proves that it doesn't matter um, and nothing matters. If you want to do something, nothing's going to get in your way. Um, so, yeah, because I try not to. So, 
you know. <laughs> okay. So now I want you all to close your eyes. Every single one of you. And if you can, I want you to plant your feet flat on the floor. Um, that is if your volume is turned up, I hope you can hear. Um, now, it doesn't matter if you've never been to the sea before. It doesn't matter if you've never seen it. I just want you to listen for a minute. 30 to 50% of global carbon is absorbed by the ocean. 50 to 70% of the oxygen you breathe is created in the ocean. 80% of that ocean is unmapped, but it occupies 90% of the planet. Sound in the ocean moves almost five times faster than it does in the air. And 90% of that ocean is in darkness. Oh. Wow. It doesn't matter if you've never been there. It doesn't matter if you've never, never seen it, never touched it, never smelled it. It doesn't matter because you're still connected to it. Your life is still connected to it. I know that might sound tree huggery, but I'm a proud tree hugger. We all depend on the ocean. So these guys here are called plankton. They are one of my favorite things one of my favorite things in the ocean. They're microscopic, you can't see them. There can be around a million of those in a teaspoon of salt water and all life on earth depends on them. But they are tiny, you cannot see them. Some you can. So there are two main types of plankton. There are zooplankton, which are living animals. Uh, they are also the larva of species like fish, uh, crabs and jellyfish. Then there are phytoplankton, which are like tiny plants. That's what causes algae, things like that. That is all caused by phytoplankton, who are the ones who produce the oxygen. And they are the absolute base of the food web. We call it the food web, not the food chain, because if you ever look at it, you'll see why. It's not as straightforward as you learn in some primary schools. I don't know kind of what everyone's different experience with that is, um, but yeah. So plankton comes from the Greek word planktos, which means to wander or to drift. And that's because these little guys, they don't really <laughs> move on their own. They can, but they mostly depend on currents, um, which is why they get that name. And like I said, some stay microscopic and some, they grow up and they become much bigger things. One of my favorite bigger things is this little guy. This tiny, tiny little guy starts his life as plankton. And yet that little guy becomes one of the biggest spawny fish in the sea. That is the Atlantic blue marlin. I think it's quite incredible how a tiny little thing becomes that, but it does. Um, so this is the Atlantic blue marlin. They can grow up to 14 feet in length and they reach speeds of 50 miles an hour. They are part of the sports fish. So that is sailfish. And why can't I think of the term I'm looking for? Sailfish and woo. I'll have to get back to you on that. I can guarantee it'll come to you. <laughs> guarantee it will. I've got notes here and I'm looking, but it's not telling me. Um, but yeah, so males can live about 18 years, females about 30, and they can reach up to 816 kilograms. So I just want to kind of ask what connects you to the sea? Um, I want to know what you think of when you think of the sea, um, when, what you think of when you think of conservation, um, and what experiences you have around it, because it, there's no point me talking um, if I don't kind of know what you already know, um, what you already care about and are passionate about, or just enjoy, and kind of what you've seen, heard, memories of, anything at all, um, what your kind of connection is to the sea. So cetaceans are our, our whales, um, dolphins and porpoise. Um, these are all my pictures that show you off. These are all from my internship. Um, so 
sorry, I forget that you can see that. There we go. So the this guy here is the orca that you're talking about, our lovely Aranicus orca or killer whales. Uh free willy. <laughs> um this guy here, he's a humpback I got to name. That was really cool. Um yeah. And, and this is a humpback as well. These are humpbacks. This is a behavior called fluke slapping. He's actually surrounded by orca. We think he was kind of telling them off. They were getting a bit too, not too close. Orca are not likely to try and go for an adult humpback, but they were certainly trying to eat his food or getting in his way of eating his food. So he was just getting rid of them basically with this big tail slap and it was so loud. I do have a video somewhere of it and it's so loud, but it was so impressive and so amazing. Um, and this um, behavior here, this is, was lunge feeding. So they were diving right deep into the water and then coming up as fast as they could, mouths open and shut and down and they eat plankton. There are two types of cetacean. These are odontoceti, which are the whales with teeth. So that's your killer whales, sperm whales, anything that can eat squid or anything like that, a dronticeti. Then you've got your metaceti, and these are your baleen whales. So that's your humpback whales, um, blue whales, anything with that baleen teeth. I'm guessing everyone kind of has, has an idea of what baleen looks like and things like that. Um, it's like bristles, bristle, big bristly teeth. There are about 90 different species of cetacean in the world that we know of. We have just had new one identified this year. Very exciting. I believe it was off the coast of Mexico. That was really cool. Um, and studies show that species like orca have different vocalizations, um, much like a different language. Uh, each pod has their own. It's completely unique. Um, their behaviors are all learned. From their families. Um, there is a pod of orca in South Africa that has learned to beach itself to get seals. No other pod of orca, or at least not many, exhibit that behaviour. It's a very risky one, but it works for them and they teach their calves and it goes on and on. And it shows this massive bond they have. Orca especially are very closely bonded to their family. They will live with them all their lives, uh, stick with their mums. They are a matriarchal pod, uh, they make up and yeah they stick with mum basically and i just something about that kind of shows how you go to say how human they are but they're not human <laughs> they're not human they're orca they're killer whales but how that love of our family that a lot of us have um i don't want to generalize because i know everyone has different but that kind of relationship that we have with friends and family that bond that we have that connection they have it too just because it looks different, just because you can't hear it really, they have it too. Um, there are cases of um, uh, orca calf being taken away from its mother in captivity. And that mother made long range vocalizations, which means she was calling to her calf. If it was short range, it means that it's close to her. She was making long range because she was trying to contact it over a long distance. They have this intelligence and it's incredible. And I think it's lost on people an awful lot how amazingly intelligent they are. Uh, species like humpback will do a hunting method called bubble netting. They will blow a, a ring of bubbles around a school of fish to keep them all together. And then another one will come up underneath it to eat them. And it's just like, how clever, how, how, how in, like, clever do you have to kind of be to think of that as a, a whale in a cetacean? These guys live in a world that has very little light. They depend on sound. They use uh, echolocation. They sing. And these are all ways that they communicate with each other without saying anything. That it's how they find each other, find mates, uh, how they hunt and how they eat and how they survive. And it's just, I just personally think it's so incredible. Um, and knowing that they can have that kind of bond with their pods, I feel like connects us to them so much more. Um, yeah, so that's kind of just my little bit on cetaceans. Um, that is the name for the entire group of um, whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Disturbance, especially right now in the Northeast, where I am, Northeast UK, Yorkshire, 
big problem. Uh, we have a lot of people seeing a seal on the beach and going, oh, look at that seal and wanting to go and take a picture. And as much as I want you to love the ocean and I want you to want to kind of experience things and see things, I also want you to know how to do it correctly, safely for you and for the animal. Um, so as I said, seals, there are three stages to seal disturbance. One is if they're looking, two is if they move slightly, and three, which is the most drastic, is when they run into the water. Now, that might not seem a big deal to us. To a seal, the rest they get on land is critical. The minutes they have there is minutes they can spend hunting, getting food and surviving. When a seal um, stampedes, it's called, into the ocean, sometimes it's over rocks. That can cause injuries. Um, it can cause um, entanglements. If they're pregnant, it can mean they lose pups or their pups might get uh, left behind. Um, and then their mums are likely to not come back because they've been disturbed and they might be scared away from that area for a long time because they still think that dangerous, scary thing is still there. So to watch seals well, um, there are a number of different organisations I will shout out to here. Uh, Cornwall Seal Wildlife Trust have a brilliant seal disturbance um, kind of fact sheet and how you can uh, do it properly. Um, stay low to the ground. Seals have an amazing sense of smell. If you can stay downwind, that's preferable. Uh, trying to stay down low, even if you're on a cliff edge, they can still see you. People think if they're on top of a cliff and the seals are down here, it's fine. Still try and stay low, um, they can still see you. People don't realise that, and that's why we kind of need to share this information. Um, they can also hear really well. So if you're watching seals, try to be as quiet as you can be. Um, so that's kind of that. Also, if you see a seal on the beach, uh, in the UK, we have an organisation called the BDMLR. This also goes for if you see anything washed up, any living creature washed up on the beach, if it's dead or alive, call BDMLR that, or email them or you can uh, they have an app. And that's British Divers Marine Life Rescue. They can deal with anything that's stuck. If you see a seal that looks like it's in trouble, that's who you call. Don't try and help it yourself. Don't try and get a friend to help it. They are the professionals that are trained to do it. So they know how to do it. Also, if you see anything entangled, they deal with that as well. Um, now, when we come back to our cetaceans, our lovely, uh, especially dolphins on our coastal areas, um, a lot of people out on the sea, obviously you see a dolphin, you want to go and see the dolphins. Um, but again, they're traveling, they're eating, all that behavior they could be feeding. And if they get disturbed, that feeding is very, very important. Uh, they might not be able to feed again for the rest of the day. So obviously we don't like being interrupted now at dinner time because then we get hungry. We get really annoyed when we're hungry. It's kind of the same for them, but it's more survival based. So um, never approach a cetacean from either like forward or straight on or from behind. Don't do it. Try and stay about 300 meters distance Turn off the engines of the boat if you're on a boat. I know um, most of you said you don't really like open water, so probably wouldn't apply. But if you are looking at companies to go, um, looking at stations, anything like that, try and see if they have something in place um, to make sure that the uh, animal is safe. It also stops things like ship strike, uh, which is pretty self-explanatory. It's when the boat hits something. Happens quite often, unfortunately, and again, causes a lot of injuries, can cause death, can cause infection. So we want to make sure that we are respecting the animals. Um, it's up to their survival. Operation Z-Bird is a new um, thing that's kind of, I've just heard about in the Northeast because we've had so much disturbance happening. Um, and it's about respecting nesting sites um, and things like that. So, I know that's a bit short and a little bit um, kind of brief, um, but it's more trying to bring awareness to disturbance. It's a very important thing that we are all probably guilty of at some point in time, but we don't mean it. And that's why we need to know about it and then we can avoid it. And then it's great and we can watch things and see things and they can be safe and we can be happy and it's happy. And that's how we want to be able to see. So I hope that was okay.
those in South Africa are probably going to be thinking of one specific type of shark. Uh, maybe, I don't know, but the great white. <laughs> um, yeah. Sharks are not as scary as people think. They look scary and I understand why, but they're really not. So um, the, I'm not good with my left and right. Um, the strange looking, oh, I've got a mouse. I can do that, that would help. This guy here, this is a Greenland shark. They live in icy water, deep in the icy water. They can live hundreds of years. I believe, I'll need to double check this. I believe the oldest is a hundred years old. Wow. But it could be 200, but I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure it's a hundred. Um, yeah. Uh, so, but we don't know much about them. They live really far down in very cold water and we don't have the technology really to um, study them, but they're pretty cool. They have a special type of plankton called a copepod that live in its eye, that eat its eye. So they're blind. <laughs> um, yeah, so they're really interesting. Um, then we have our hammerheads, again, quite an iconic species of shark here. Um, this is the shark in Mako shark. They can reach up to um, 80 miles an hour, I believe it was. I'm just going to double check. I do have nods. It might be cheating, but I am going to double check. Yeah, 80 miles an hour. Um, wow. Yeah, they're pretty fast. Um, but they're kind of cute. Look at the eyes. They have like these big eyes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the shark that kind of freaks me out the most is this little guy. This little guy is a cookie cutter shark. He reaches about this big and he freaks me out because he can take chunks out of submarines and great white sharks. Um, wow. Yeah, he's not scared of anything. These guys have what they call bioluminescence. Is everyone kind of, um, kind of know what that is? It's where they light up. Um, in the dark, basically, um, using special chemicals in their skin. Uh, and that's underneath them. And that does that because when they're, they swim above the kind of higher up in the deep sea, so it's dark, but they're kind of on a higher level. Does that make sense? High in the deep sea, it's a bit of an oxymoron, but I hope it kind of gives a decent idea. Um, but because they're like up underneath, it looks like loads of tiny little fish. So big animal like a great white's going to come up and be like there's loads of little fish that i'm going to eat that and when the great white for example does that the cookie cutter does a u-turn turns around on it bites it takes a chunk out of it and swims away and the reason they get their name is because they leave like a circular cookie cutter bite it's more kind of like a cylinder um but it's called a cookie cutter um they have all their teeth connected in a circle and yeah, they're pretty brave. <laughs> uh, they've taken chunks out of submarines. Um, the, they're not lethal. The reason that animals might die from a cookie cutter shark is more from infection from a bite. But there's loads of pictures of like uh, dolphins and that uh, with quite, it's quite an obvious bite. It's a perfect circle. Um, yeah, they're, they're one of my favorite types of shark. This guy here, I had to throw in because it's uh, Steve Backshall's favorite shark. It's the tasseled wobbegong. Um, and also to kind of show that most shark species aren't big. Um, this guy is, um, a, he's a bottom dweller. And yeah, so they're kind of cool with all these kind of tassely bits on them. Mm -hmm. And then we have the great white. I think it's quite an iconic species. Um, the Steven Spielberg um, actually felt so guilty about the effect of Jaws and it, the image that it created for Great Whites that a whole organization was set up to protect them, <laughs> which I think is um, pretty, um, pretty significant. Um, so sharks don't have any bones. Instead, they've got an entirely cartilaginous skeleton. Um, they have special um, senses called, and I can never pronounce this, so you might have to excuse me, the Ampue Ampueli of Lorenzi, and they detect electromagnetic pulses from fish, so the movements that ripple afterwards, they can detect it and find the fish. Sometimes you can see it, um, I don't think you can in those pictures on the thread, you might be able to on the great white, let's look. 
So they tend to be kind of along this line here, but you can't really see them. Um, I'm afraid I should have got a picture, but. Um, so there's about 500 species of shark. Um, you're more likely to be hit by lightning, become a millionaire, win an Olympic gold medal, um, or be crushed by a vending machine, then you are to be attacked by a shark. <laughs> um, so I don't know how many vending machines you use, but, um, and one of the biggest threats to shark finning, uh, to sharks is shark, the shark finning industry. Now in the UK, we've had a big win on this. We used to have a 30 kilogram allowance of shark fin. You could import it from another country, fine. Now you can't at all. Um, it does exist in the UK, and I recommend a documentary by, of all people, Gordon Ramsay, um, and it was brilliant, and it was all about shark finning, and it really goes in depth into it. Um, like I said, I'm kind of skimming over things right now, um, just to kind of get your mind going. We need to end the stigma around sharks, because it's the only way we're going to protect them. They are incredible. They're essential to the ocean as most life is in the ocean. They are an apex predator, which means that they are the top dogs um and we need them um and unfortunately we are their biggest threat rather than being to us um i think that's why i threw sharks in here um because they really do we love our dolphins um but we need to start looking at sharks just as much so kind of your few main pointers that i wanted to kind of put in here was that we need to be aware of disturbance. Ways that we can impact and have a positive impact on our oceans and on our planet is through things like beach cleans and litter picks. If you're not near a beach, you can do a litter pick anywhere. I do it when I take my dog out. We have a shop called Poundland in the UK, um, or you can use Amazon or anything. I got my first litter picker for a pound. I get people all the time coming up to me and saying, thank you, oh, you're doing such a good job. And I say, oh, well, it only costs two, three pounds, but they don't want to do that. And it's like, but you're thanking me. You're saying it's good and you like it and you don't want the rubbish there, but you're not just going to pick it up because there's this weird image about litter picking. Like, I don't know. I find money sometimes. So, you know, <laughs> if anything's going to be an incentive, you could find some money. Um, Report strandings and sightings. Um, like I said, we have the BDMLL, that's our main organization. If you see something or anything like that, they log it and then we can track things, know how the species is and know what our area is like for that species. It's all very important. It's called citizen science. It's what you can do. You are a citizen scientist and we need that information. Scientists need that information. Um, Use alternatives um, to driving, if possible, if you can get a bus. I know this is kind of a luxury thing that everyone can. If you can walk, bike, share a car, anything, try and do it. Um, reduce your plastic. Um, big one. Um, very difficult. I'm not zero waste. It takes everyone to do it imperfectly. Not everyone to do it perfectly. You can't all do it perfectly. Not everyone has that ability. Not everyone has that privilege. So if we can do whatever little we can, whether it be you don't use plastic bags anymore. I work at Subway. The amount of people who ask me for a plastic carrier bag and I give them evils and I don't care. They get an evil look off me because they don't need it. They buy a single sandwich. They buy one sandwich and need a bag. So, yeah. Um, do you need new clothes? The clothing industry is a massive, massive problem um, with conservation. So do you need those new clothes or is it you want them? Um, again, that's a privileged thing. Not everyone can go out and buy new clothes anywhere. Um, but try and go secondhand. Try swapping. Try, you know, revamping. There's all different things you can do. And uh, the last thing on this list is hands up if you've ever released a sky lantern or a balloon in memory or for a celebration. Let's not do that anymore. Those things end up in the ocean, they end up in farmer's fields, they end up everywhere and animals eat them, get stuck in them, they end up in waterways and they pollute. So I am gonna ask that, we don't do that anymore, we don't need to do that. How about bubbles? How about having flowers, putting flowers in a somewhere? There are a lot of other things, petals, we can throw petals. I know it sounds daft, but 
isn't it just as daft to light a lantern that you've paid what like 15 20 pounds for into the sky just watch it float away it looks beautiful but trust me it's not beautiful when it's finished with they can cause fires things like that it's not worth it i've let them loose many a time and didn't think anything of it but that's why now we're here to talk because now we all know um so yeah um and this is kind of my last little bit this is the wonderful david attenborough thank you steph that was absolutely amazing thank you for having me